Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Great to see if you're watching online. I know a few people are, uh, are watching online, um, including my mum, which is good because she's doing the dinner. Um, so <laughs> if it's on cooking. Don't forget to put those uh, potatoes on. Just mentioning that. Some of you go, what? He's, what's he on about? But it's important that to a roast dinner on Sunday. Anyone else like roast dinner on a Sunday? It's just something about Sunday. It has to be roast dinner, doesn't it? And uh, we go to my mum's a lot, and she, she's, uh, she's great at roast dinner. Some of you will have, have tested that. Anyway, it's good to see you, uh, whether you're watching online or whether you're here. Um, we're beginning a new series today. Um, uh, we're following the prayer course, um, which is uh, part of the 24-7 prayer network by Pete uh, Grieg. And uh, it's, it's fantastic. We've got 44 people doing this prayer course. I think that's an amazing, amazing take up. Um, 17 or 18 people are actually doing it here at the Oak Tree Centre on Thursdays. Um, and uh, other people are, are doing it in their life groups. We did it in our life group this week, just gone. And uh, it led up some, some interesting discussion. And uh, it, was just, it was just fantastic to, to do that. So um, yeah, I'm sure there's still time to come along on a Thursday evening and do the prayer course. Uh, I want to share something, that, a little tool that will help you later on as we, uh, uh, as we go through the service to, to help with prayer. Um, but we'll do that a little bit later on. Today is World Mental Health Day. I don't know whether you're aware of that. But it is. I was doing uh, my devotional this morning, and uh, that was we were talking about that. And so I want to read Psalm 40 um, to you because I don't know, I don't know how you've come into this place this morning. You know, I think I think sometimes we we turn up at church and we expect that everyone's going to think we're all fine and all in love with Jesus and life's just peachy. But the reality is, it's not right. Anyone else had a tough week? I'm putting my hand up not to demonstrate because I've had a tough week, okay? And sometimes it's just like that, isn't it? We just feel and it's like, God, where are you? What's going on? Um, and it can affect our mental health. And I think we focus so much, we hear so much, don't we, about our physical health uh, with diets and exercise and all that kind of thing. But what about our mental health? You know, God created us with a, a mental capacity. Um, and uh, it's through our mental health and our mental capacity that we... Uh, get in touch with him and we talk to him and we have our relationship with him and if our mental capacity is um, struggling and is out of balance and things are not good for us then that can affect how we spend time with him and our prayer life so I just I don't know how you've come into this place this morning but I want to read Psalm 40 verses 1 to 3 to you from the New Living Translation um, and just leave it with you and as we go through this morning whatever you whatever place you're at whatever you come into just reach out to God and just tell him how you feel I think that's the one thing we learned about the 24 prayer, um, sorry, the prayer course on, on, on uh, this week, the first session, was about just keeping it real, keep it simple, just talk to God and keep it. We don't have to have eloquent language, just keep it real, keep it simple, tell God how you feel. So this is Psalm 41 to 3, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. Isn't that good news? God is attentive to what we're saying. He lifted me out of the pit. Uh, of despair out of the mud and the mire he set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along he has given me a new song to sing and a hymn of praise to our God isn't that good even when 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 times are tough and we're walking through the mud and the mire uh, he will set our feet on solid ground and give us a new song to sing in our hearts folks let's stand shall we I'm just going to pray and uh, we're just going to spend some time in uh, worship together Father, we just want to worship you this morning, uh, and Father, you are welcome in this place. Uh, Father, we welcome you here with our hearts, with our minds. We just uh, want to lift our voices to you in, in praise. Father, as you look down on us this morning, you know how each and every one of us are feeling. Father, we thank you that you don't live at a distance and just look upon us. You, you make your home in our hearts, and so Father, you know probably how we're feeling before we realize how we're feeling and father i just want to pray this morning that as we worship as we look at your word as we fellowship together lord that you will just help us to be uh, even if we struggle to be honest with each other we'll be honest with you and that father you will meet us in that place of need in whatever situation it is wherever we have come to in our journey with you will meet us in that place today and just lead us forward. Father, if we people have come into this place this morning or are watching online and, and they feel like they're walking through like treacle, life is just tough. Lord, I just pray you bring freedom from that in Jesus' name. Father, I pray you just lift people up and set their feet on solid ground. Give them a new song in their heart. Give them a new uh, a joy in their spirit, we pray, for this week ahead. Father, do a mighty work this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, through the power of your Holy Spirit and all God's people said.
Amen. 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 Thank you, Justin. Margaret, come and join me at the front. We'd love to pray for you. That's good. I'm excited about listening to what Margaret's got to bring. We were saying um, beforehand in the Brum prayer room, weren't we, that you've yeah. shared things spontaneously, but it's the first time you've preached, I think, at a morning service. Yes. But she's got such a gift to bring. Have you, are you using this mic? Oh, you got your headset mic. I've wonderful, got this, yes. wonderful. Okay. Let's pray for Margaret. Shall we just reach out your hand towards her and let's bless her? Father, we just ask for your strength, your power, your wisdom to flow through Margaret as she brings mm. your word to life um, for us this morning. Lord, we, we're open hearted and open minded to hear what you want to say to her. And as we are blessed by your word, Father, I pray that Margaret receives a double portion of your blessing as she. Uh, just shares it with us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, good morning, everybody. I have to admit that I am feeling nervous. Um, just to say, uh, maybe I shouldn't apologise at the beginning, but there's no PowerPoint. I haven't got to that yet. I need to learn how to, how to do that. But good morning to you all here. Good morning to everybody online as well and a few people who've said they can't be here so i just want to mention beth hope the dinner's going okay <laughs> and um d and val are not able to be here this morning so um i hope that you are enjoying the service so far and i think julie said that she wouldn't be able to be here so julie hope that you will be refreshed by staying at home and there's um, a gentleman called michael that quite often watches. So, Michael, if you're watching, I hope uh, you'll be blessed this morning. Before I start, I'd like us to, to pray. So let's pray. Father God, as we enter prayer now, we pause to be still. To breathe slowly. to recenter our scattered senses upon the presence of God. Holy Spirit, will you help me to communicate what's on my heart and what's in my notes and enable everyone to hear what you want to say to them? Amen. Hide and seek. How many of you played hide and seek as children? It's a game that we have played with all six of our grandchildren at different ages. The younger they were, the easier it was to find them. Because they didn't completely manage to hide so we couldn't see them. Also, they quite often hid in the same place and not always silent. But as they got older, it was more difficult to find them. In Genesis 3, verses 8 to 10 that we'll be looking at shortly, we read about Adam and Eve hiding among the trees in the Garden of Eden, hiding from God. A garden is a great place to hide. But Adam and Eve were not children. So why were they hiding? What do we know about Adam and Eve? Well, in Mike's book, First Things First, he's on page 17, he writes, there seem to be two accounts of the creation of mankind in Genesis. The one in Genesis 1 describes how God created the human race in general. The one in Genesis 2 is about the creation of a particular man who may or may not be the first. The text implies that Adam was the first man, but also that he was specially created separately to the rest of mankind referred to in Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. So let's have a look at what 
chapter 2 says about Adam and Eve. And I'm just going to draw out a few of the verses. And they are referred to, Adam and Eve are referred to as man and woman and not Adam and Eve. But if I get that mixed up, please be patient with me. In verse 7, it says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. We've actually been singing about God's breath being in us this morning, so thank you, Jocelyn, for choosing that song. God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed into it to work it, and to take care of it. God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. There were two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Verse 18, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. The man named all the animals that God had formed and brought to him, but no suitable helper was found. Then God formed a woman as a helper. He caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. He took one of the man's ribs and closed up the, fle- the place with flesh. In verse 23, in the message translation, it says, The man said, Finally, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, name her woman, for she was made for man. And at the end of that chapter, it says, The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. I'm just going to read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. I hope it's going to come up on the wall. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat from the the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. That's right, we've read Genesis 3, 1 to 7, sorry. The serpent said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Causing the woman to doubt what God had said. But the woman did say, or replied, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Did God say not to touch it? No. Clearly, the serpent's presence had some effect on the woman. It's also worth saying that the command was given to man before the woman was formed. Had she heard what Adam had told her correctly? When the woman 
saw that the fruit was, of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it says, Each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Three stages of temptation. Desire, sin or action, and death. You know, the serpent knew what he was doing. Now we're going to read three more verses. And this is Genesis 3. 8 to 10, and this is when the word then comes. <laughs> then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The word then. <laughs> Again, building the tension. What are they going to do? They heard. What was it they heard? They heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. Their ears were tuned to hearing God. They knew it was God, although they couldn't see him. There was a sense of his presence. I think they recognized God because he'd met with them before. This wasn't a one-off meeting. They probably would have looked forward to their meeting with God in anticipation. I'm not sure about the significance of it was in the cool of the day, other than the heat would have passed and it would have been a much more comfortable time to walk and talk. If you've got any ideas about that, do let me know. But this time, it was different. They were hiding from the Lord among the trees. God called to the man, where are you? Of course, God knew where they were. One of God's names is El Roy, the God who sees me. And in Psalm 139, David writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of you are there. There is no hiding from God. Nowhere where we can escape to. Where are you? What was the man's reply? I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid. Because I was naked. So I hid. What was Adam afraid of? Facing God? of God no longer loving him, of the friendship, relationship being spoiled, of being punished, but there were consequences. Being naked and ashamed. Chapter two, verses 25 said, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Something had changed. Oh dear. I wonder how God felt at this point. Sadness, disappointment, hurt. He knew what they had done. Would the words, I told you what would happen, be on his mind? It's impossible to imagine how God felt, thought, as the relationship that they had 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 been spoiled, broken. Peace had replaced, was been replaced by fear. Openness by lies, deceit and cover up, no more fun. The man now feeling guilty 
And there's the blaming game. The man blamed the woman, and in turn, the woman blamed the serpent. And there was the shame. Dictionary definition of shame is a painful emotion caused by an awareness having done something dishonorable or foolish. The word painful jumps out at me. Ouch. I wonder what Adam was trying to achieve by hiding. God could see him. But Adam must have been so consumed with his fear that he wasn't thinking clearly. Hiding among the trees, then what? What can we learn from Adam and Eve? First of all, they had a relationship with God. Let's treasure the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father. Don't let anything spoil it. Do you spend time talking with your Heavenly Father daily, what we call a quiet time? On the prayer course website, there are some prayer tools, and one is how to have a quiet time, a time to connect with God. And Peter Gregg, who runs the prayer course, has this lovely phrase, which he uses, and I think written it down here, which he uses... Um, on a free app, which I've got. Now, I'm not into apps, but I have this app. And it's called Lectio 365. And it's a 10-minute morning and evening devotional. And I actually used it, part of it, at the beginning of the service. Because he said this, As I come to prayer... I pause to be still. So when you're having like a quiet time, time in God's presence, it's good. As I come to prayer, I pause to be still, to breathe slowly, to recenter my scattered senses upon the presence of God. <coughs> I've actually found that very helpful. Saying it out loud helps too. When you're in your garden, next, talk to God. You may do already. I love how you made the roses, etc. A lot of you have probably enjoyed your gardens a lot more during lockdown. I know Jenny has from her posts on Facebook, and I know that Val enjoys her garden too. The consequences of the man and woman eating of the fruit from the tree that they were commanded not to eat from was that they died spiritually. The connection that their spirit had to God was broken and they were separated from God. Consequently, all their descendants were born spiritually alive but spiritually dead. That includes us. We were born spiritually dead. Guess what? God had a solution. God sent Jesus his only son, to die in our place on a cruel cross so we could live. John 3, 16, and we've sang it this morning. Thank you, Jocelyn. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And in John chapter 10, verse 10, we read, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. What did the man and the woman lose? Spiritual life. What did Jesus come to give us? Eternal life. We become Christians when we acknowledge before God our selfishness of doing things for ourselves and not God's way. That's sin. When we acknowledge our sin, our spirit is reconnected to God's spirit. God longs to restore the relationship between us and him. The other thing that we can learn, maybe from uh, the man, Adam, he was afraid. Are there things that you are afraid of? When I first started to prepare this sermon a few weeks ago, I felt like running away. 
I really did. I didn't feel I could do it. I heard myself say, you'll struggle to communicate. You know you're not good at being disciplined to write things down. Accusations. And where do they come from? The accuser. Satan. They were lies. I acknowledged them to God in prayer and received his help and told the enemy to clear off. <laughs> also, Mike and Ross have encouraged me too. What pleases me about the man Adam is that he answered God's question. Where are you? He could have kept quiet. He acknowledged that he had heard him, that he was afraid because he was naked, giving the game away that he'd eaten the fruit. So I hid, he said. He was talking to God, explaining his feelings. At the beginning of the service, Ross was talking about us talking to God. And do you talk to God about things that make you fearful? I mentioned earlier about God being the God who sees us. There are no circumstances in our lives that escape his fatherly awareness and care. God knows us and our troubles. The name of God as the God who sees me is mentioned in Genesis chapter 16, where we read the story of Hagar, who is running away from Sarai, Abraham's wife, because she was ill-treating her. An angel of the Lord met with Hagar and told her to go back to her mistress and to submit to her. Then the angel blessed her. I wonder if any of you are feeling like running away from a situation. Maybe you're being bullied. Maybe you're in a situation that is too hard to bear. Are you fearful of COVID-19? For yourself, children, elderly parents, are you fearful about your finances, employment, health, your children's education, your future, your studies? Fears are best faced head on, not by running away, not by burying your head into the sand. Look for the lies you may be telling yourself. Declare scripture over your situation. When I was receiving chemo four years ago, I declared Psalm 139 verse 16 all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Whatever the doctors were saying to me, God, my heavenly father, is in control of my days. So, declare scripture over your situations. Adam, the man, hid. On the 25th of August when I was reading my Bible notes, it read this, God doesn't play hide and seek with his will for your life. I noted it down because I'd started thinking about mentioning hide and seek. I would agree with this statement as God desires to share his will for our lives with us. God used the prophet Jeremiah in 29, 11 and 12, to tell the surviving elders among the Israelites the following. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, I don't think God would have put that in his word if he didn't want to convey that to us as well. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I started talking about playing hide-and-seek with our grandchildren at the beginning. I believe that God does play hide-and-seek with us, not so that we can't find him, 
but to enjoy the process of us seeking him and finding him. As we continue in Jeremiah 29, verses 13 and 14, it says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And in 1 Chronicles 28, 9, David said to his son Solomon, if you seek him, God, he will be found by you. I don't know whether you are aware, but 2 Chronicles 7.14 has been very instrumental during the coronavirus pandemic. There was a worldwide prayer initiative to encourage people to read set prayers at 7.14 in the morning and 7.14 in the evening each day. I believe it stopped back in in March. But 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and guess what? And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And a couple more verses to do with seeking. 2 Chronicles 15.2, the priest Azariah said to King Asa, if you seek him, he will be found by you. Proverbs 8.17 says, I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. And this is a verse I was given when I was baptized. Matthew 7.7, 7, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and and the door will be open to you. I gave Mike my notes to read. And at the end, he had a thought, which I'm going to share with you. Sometimes God hides in the dark, scary circumstances, waiting to surprise us or comfort us. But you know what? God enjoys being found. I'll say that again. God enjoys being found. I was going to finish there, but one thought came to me. At some time during my sermon preparation, I was reminded of a gospel song I used to sing, wait for it, 50 years ago, 5 <laughs> years ago, which God used to encourage me during my chemo th treatment. I parked the thought about using it. But last Sunday morning, while Mike and I were listening to the church service on the local Three Counties radio, which we actually listened to today, and it was Steve Chalk and Graham Kendrick were doing the service. The service was a, from a church in Aston, Birmingham, my hometown. Just to pass that, you know, put that in. During the service, which was about prayer, Someone sang that gospel song, which I had parked. Remember it, it was actually written, or copyright was 1912. It's an old, old song. The song is called In the Garden. The first verse starts with, I come to the garden alone. The chorus is, and he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there. Oof, none other has ever known. The words, I come to the garden alone, spoke to me. When having chemo, and I'm sure that with Claire in your situation, nobody else could go through it for me. I was facing something that I had to go through on my own. But God was with me. We had a relationship. And to finish, God longs to have a relationship with us. And remember, God enjoys being found when we seek him. And I just to say, when 
playing with the grandchildren hide and seek. I can remember when they were really little and they found you. The sheer you know, hugs and so, so pleased. But I feel that God, that's what God wants us to feel this morning. When we seek him, he wants to be found. And when we find him, he wants us to give us a big hug. Let's just pray. Oh. Father God, thank you that you love us and that you long for us to have a relationship with you. You long for us to seek you and to find you. And that whatever circumstances we are going through in life, you are there with us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. through those things that Margaret shared as she was talking about maybe you're feeling like maybe feeling like you're running away maybe running away from a person maybe you're carrying something that's too hard to bear maybe it's a situation you're walking through that is you just want to escape from that maybe it's a situation where you're being bullied Or maybe you're fearful of the pandemic, the virus, which is still around us. Maybe you're fearful of finances or lack of finances. Maybe you're concerned about your employment. Maybe you're struggling with your health. Maybe you're thinking about your child's education. Some challenges there, maybe. Or maybe you're worried about the future. What does the future hold? I believe God's calling us up this morning. Because he wants to show us the answer to those things we're struggling with but to see it from his perspective. We just see what's around us, but he can see the beginning from the end. In Psalm 24, verses 3 to three and 4, it says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And maybe, maybe you're thinking, right, how can I approach God? How can I even talk to God? I don't have clean hands. I don't have a pure heart. How can I go up? How I have to stay at the bottom of the mountain. How can I go up? How can I allow God to show me from his perspective? When I'm struggling with these things, how can I feel? I feel guilt-ridden. How, do I, how can I go up? Friends, we can go up because of what Jesus has done. We can let God lead us up that mountain to see things from his perspective because of what Jesus has done in us and through us. We have the right to climb the mountain. We have the right to stand with God because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Do you remember the story in the Old Testament where the Israelites come to the foot of the mountain and God says, don't, don't come near it. If you touch it, you'll die. If you... And they're fearful of it. But Moses actually walks up the mountain and when he comes down, his face is glowing because he's been in the presence of God. But Moses had to go up. The people couldn't go up, but Moses went up. <clears throat> That's not the situation now. Because of what Jesus has done, we can approach.
approach the mountain, we can touch the mountain, we can go up the mountain. And our souls will shine as we spend time with Father, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. Those things that Margaret shared, I've just read out there, they're real. And there'll be other things as well. And God understands that. He understands where the challenges we face in life. But he's calling you this morning saying, come up, I want to show it from, show it to you from my perspective. I want to show you the beginning from the end. I want to show you that there is a bigger picture here. And you're not alone. I want to show you that when there's one set of footprints, that's not yours. That's me carrying you. I want to show you the things that are to come. I want to show you how you're going to grow through this situation. So we're going to continue to worship. But let's just allow God to show us things from his perspective. And let's allow him to shine a light on those difficult situations we're walking through. And see it in a new way. Father, we thank you for being with us this morning. We thank you for what you've been speaking to us about through the words that Margaret, Margaret brought through those words that we've sung. Father, we thank you we don't need to fear because you're with us. We don't need to fear the road ahead because you can show us how we must walk and what we must walk through. You can show us things from your perspective. We can see things from a, from a kingdom perspective, from the perspective of heaven. Father, we just pray you reveal to us, those of us who are going through challenges at this time, we've got questions, they're struggling. Father, just meet us in that place and show us where you are. Reveal to us what you want to teach us in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. And Father, as we gather here now, and because it's World Mental Health Day, we want to lift people to you that we know. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe guys, it's you here, maybe it's you watching. Or maybe it's people you know who are struggling with their, with mental health and challenges. That can be a crippling thing. Father, we ask, will you bring healing in Jesus' name? Will you set people's minds free? And will you just meet them in that, what can be a very dark space? And meet them in that place and just show them where you are. Father, give them a hug. <laughs> show them that they're loved in Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this morning's service. It's been great to have you with us. I just wanted to very briefly share with you how you can give your heart to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. I became a Christian when I was eight years old at a kid's summer holiday club. And it was an amazing time. And I remember praying a very simple prayer and I remember the feeling in my heart, in my life, that I just had that feeling inside of me. Something changed when Jesus came into my life. And the great thing is that when we do it, when we ask Jesus into our life, he doesn't just add it onto his to-do list. It happens straight away, straight away. And it's just, it's, it's the best decision we could make in life. You can change the trajectory of your life when you ask him in. And when he comes in, he comes in to, to be your friend, to be your Lord, to be your saviour, to be your helper in difficult times. And you know, I've been through some incredibly difficult times in my life, but I know that God has helped me every step of the way. Jesus has been with me every step of the way. And when I've had important decisions to make, I've prayed about them. And Jesus has helped me to make the right decision. When I've gone through tough times, he's comforted me and enabled me to get through those difficult times where otherwise I probably would have taken another course of action, but he's helped me in those times. And so when I was eight years old, I remember praying a very simple prayer, and, and the prayer involved just these few simple sentences. I asked Jesus to forgive me. I admitted that I'd done something wrong. I repented of my sin, and I made that 180 degree turn to start following him. And so if you want to do that this morning, if you want to take that step, that I want to help you pray that prayer. So if you're ready for that now, let's do it now. So just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I have sinned. I recognize that I've done my life my way. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I repent of my sin. 
please come into my life. I choose right here, right now, to make that 180 degree turn and start following you and living my life the way you'd want me to. Please come into my life to be my Lord and Saviour. Amen. And if you've prayed that, then that's then fantastic. I'm so pleased for you that you've changed the trajectory of your life. You have made the most important decision you could make in your entire life. But I want you to do two things for me. The first thing is this. I want you to get in contact with me and let me know that you've prayed that prayer. And the reason is because then we can be accountable to one another. We can support one another. So when you send me an email, the email address will come up at the bottom of the screen. I can get back in touch with you and I can send you some, some information to help you uh, on your journey as a new Christian. The second thing I want you to do is to get into a good church. Now I don't know where you live, if you live in Milton Keynes you're welcome to come to Shenley Christian Fellowship or there are other great churches in this city that you can be a part of. But if you live at other places in the country then I want to try and help you find the church to be a part of. It's important that we're part of a church which is welcoming, a church that teaches the Bible, a church that believes in great worship, and also a church that will help you on your journey as a Christian. We call it discipleship, but, but it's basically teaching us how to, how to live our life as a Christian. And so I wanna help you do that if I possibly can. So thank you for being with us this morning. I'm so pleased that you made that step, but if you haven't prayed that prayer and you still need time to think, then I want to encourage you to think it through. And I wanna encourage you to pray and ask Jesus and say, can you help me in making this decision? Because he will do that. And, uh, and we, I just want to bless you this morning. So just take care and stay safe.